Okay, uh, so I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for this, for this great, uh, great conference and giving the opportunity to speak and also for picking this as the photo of the, of the conference because it, it nicely matches the title of my talk, uh, which is Fear Packing and Quantum Gravity. It's, it's based on a, on a collaboration uh, done uh, with uh, Tom Hartman and Leon Leonardo Rostelli recently, and also some earlier work uh, done partly in collaboration with, with Miguel Paolo. So let's, let's begin. Uh, the, the main motivation for, for the talk is that is to improve our understanding of the landscape of consistent theories of quantum gravity. And in the talk, I'll, I'll focus on theories in ADS, uh, in which case we can, we can say that such a theory is consistent precisely when the dual, bound, the dual CFT is consistent. In other words, that the dual CFT satisfies all the usual bootstrap constraints. So you can, you can think of it as pretty much the, the definition of what, it's, what it means to have a consistent quantum, field the uh, quantum gravity theory in ADS. Uh, in other words, we can probe the boundary of the, of the landscape of quantum gravity using the bootstrap. Now, maybe more concretely, what I'll focus on today is the general expectation that UV consistency of such theories requires the presence of other states besides gravitons in the spectrum. Usually in examples, these are black holes, there could be causal Klein modes or stringy modes. And uh, a concrete goal for today is, is going to be will be to make this a bit more precise and look for an upper bound on the mass of the lightest non-graviton state in the spectrum of such theories. This, this is kind of reminiscent of the wing gravity conjecture, which, uh, which is, uh, asserts an upper bound on the, on the mass to charge ratio of a theory. Uh, a related question is whether pure gravity can exist as a fully consistent quantum theory. Uh, pure gravity would be a theory which only has gravitons and black holes in the spectrum. And the reason these two ideas are related is that, well, if you, if you can prove an universal upper bound on the mass of the lightest non-graviton state, which is, which is well below the Planck scale, this would rule out pure gravity. Uh, so let me now quickly, let quickly tell you what the main result is. So I'll, I'll work in the context of ADS3 CFT2, wh wh when, where this task is particularly sharp, because uh, gravitons are just various descendants of the vacuum. So what we want to prove is an upper bound on the scaling dimension delta of the lightest non-vacuum non Verasoro primary uh, of, of any, any 2D CFT at large single charge C. Hellerman showed in uh, 2009 that uh, modular invariance in entirety implies such a bound, uh, which is uh, bounded above by C over six asymptotically at large single charge. And the main new result that I'll present uh, is a theorem that every unitary 2D CFT with central charge greater than 12 contains a virus or a primary other than identity with a scaling dimension bounded by C over eight plus a half. So this is an improvement of Hellerman, of the Hellerman bound from C over six to C over eight at large central charge. The, the main technique uh, that the proof uses is, uh, is the so-called analytic functionals, uh, which I'll review later. They, they were developed recently in the context of the, of the correlator bootstrap. And along the way, we'll uncover a very surprising and close connection to the recent solution of the sphere packing problem in dimension 8 and 24. So really, you, you can use these functionals to, to reproduce the, 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 the Azovskas proof of the, of the, of this, um, uh, the solution of the, of the sphere packing problem. Now, I should also say that in our paper with, with Rastelli and Hartmann, we, we actually proved a, a better bound, uh, which, uh, at large, which at large charge goes like C over 8.5 or then C over 8, but, uh, it's, it's much easier to explain the, the, the C over eight, so I'll, I'll, focus, I'll focus on that in this talk. Here is the plan for the rest of the talk. There'll be two parts. Uh, I'll start by, by talking about the Verasoro modular bootstrap and proving the main, main theorem using the analytic functionals. And in the second part of the talk, I will, I'll explain what is the connection to this few packing problem and, and finish by explaining how, how you can reproduce the proof, the solution in eight and 24 dimensions using this technique. So let's get started. ADS3 CFT2 and the modular bootstrap, well, we are interested in the regime where gravity is weakly coupled. So this means the 2D CFT has a large central charge. This is what a spectrum of such a theory would, would look like, spectrum of scaling dimensions. There is the, the vacuum, which is empty ADS. Okay, that guy. Uh, the, the gravitons are just the various or descendants of the vacuum. And then at some point, there's going to be the first various or primary with scaling dimension delta gap that we want to bound from above. And as a reference point, it's useful to think, uh, to, to keep in mind that 
uh, we expect uh, the, the BTC black holes to start at approximately C over 12. So the black holes are some other Verosor primaries. Well, it, it, it could be that O is a, o is a black hole. Oh, there they are. Uh, the main object is the torus partition function at zero angular potential. So you can expand it into states on the, on the torus or on the circle and organize the sum into Verosor primaries where this chi, chi of delta is the, is the Verosor character that takes this form and Q is just the norm of these are two pi i tau. The, the constraint that I'll, I'll use in the talk is just modular invariance under the S transformation, which, is, which uh, says that Z is invariant under tau goes to minus one over tau. Physically, this has the interpretation of large bulk diffeomorphisms and it also nicely manifests the UVIR connection that we expect in gravity because uh, well, heavy modes on the, on the left-hand side get mapped to light modes on the right-hand side, roughly speaking. Uh, you can organize the, the, the equation in this way, some of the primaries of the difference of the characters equal to zero. And you can already see this is impossible to satisfy just with the vacuum module because the vacuum character is not invariant under the S transformation. Let me, let me stress that I'm working here with, with full-fledged CFTs, not, not necessarily chiral CFTs, so the scaling dimensions can be generally non-integer, and, and this, this function defined over here does not generally satisfy invariance under the T-transformation. Now, functional bootstrap is a way to prove upper bounds on delta gap starting from the previous slide. It was developed uh, in, a, in a work by Ratazzi, Richkov, Tony, and Vicky. So you can organize the equation like this. Fa capital Phi is the difference of the character and the S transform character, sum over primaries. And now we think of functionals, omega, acting on functions of tau in the upper half plane. So if you can find, if, if there exists a linear functional omega that's positive when acting on this, on this function vacuum, on this vacuum function, and, uh, and it's non-negative from some delta star onwards, then it follows the delta gap in all unitary 2D CFTs must be, must be less than delta star. So this follows just by applying omega to the, to the above equation. And the central question is, for a given central charge, what is the best or minimal upper bound that I'm going to call delta V of C, following from this logic, and what is the corresponding f functional omega? The expectation is that at large central charge, this bound scales linearly with C, with some coefficient mu, and we would like to perfectly know what is the value of mu? In particular, if, if one can show that mu is less than one over 12, which unfortunately I won't in this talk, but it, it would prove that semi-classical pure gravity is not consistent as a quantum theory, because at th this is where the black holes start at, one, at C over 12. Uh, now let me describe some of the previous results uh, following from the functional bootstrap. Uh, ty people typically use this ansatz for the, for the functional, some finite sum over derivatives at the, at the asymmetric point, and you want to optimize over alpha to get the best bound. Now, Hellerman showed in his, in his seminal work that just with two derivatives, you can get a non-trivial bound, namely that uh, the upper bound on, the, on this first primary is at most c over six plus order one, at, uh, at order one number at large central charge. And in fact, later on, it was shown that if you, if you keep n fixed and finite, uh, you cannot improve this bound asymptotically, that it, it stays C over six with any, any finite fixed N. However, numerics indicates that the actual asymptotic bound is stronger, that, that the, the asymptotic slope is better than one over six. So this means that the large central charge limit and the large N limit do not commute, and one needs to take the, the large N limit for at, at a fixed central charge and then extrapolate to, to large C. And in particular, there are some conjectures based on these finite C numerics. Uh, all of which indicate that the bound should go something, the actual bound should go s like something like C over nine, the paper by Collier and Ian, and Afkami, Jedi, Hartman, and, and Tajdini uh, very recently. But we would like to make progress analytically, not, not numerically, and at arbitrary large C, so for that, we really need a different construction of, the, of this functional omega to make some analytic progress. Let me say a few more words about what the, what the optimal functional is, because I, I can imagine it can be a rather unfamiliar object to most of you. So the idea is that the solution of the bootstrap with the maximal delta gap, which is equal to the optimal bound, comes together with the optimal, also known as extremal functional omega. And this, op this optimal functional must vanish on the, on the optimal spectrum and is non-negative above delta gap. So from this, it follows that it has this characteristic structure 
it, it, uh, it has double zeros on the, on the optimal spectrum, except for the, the first, except for the first very sort of primary where it, it has simple zero. Uh, unfortunately, the, analytic, the only analytic construction of the optimal functional known so far uh, is for the, in the context of the four point function bootstrap on a line. Uh, but nevertheless, this, this construction is going to be enough to prove the main theorem and make the connection to the, to the sphere packing problem. So now uh, I'm going to review uh, the construction, the idea behind this, these optimal functionals for the 1D conformal bootstrap. Um, so the setup is that we put four conformal primaries on a line, four sigmas. The crossing equation in this context is, uh, looks like this. There is a sum over the primaries in the OP of two sigmas over the OP coefficient squared, so that's a positive number, times the difference of the S-channel and T-channel conformal block. Because we are in 1D, uh, the conformal group is SL2R, so these are the so-called SL2R conformal blocks. And Z is the, is the single cross ratio of four, or four insertions on a line. Here it, it turns out that the, the solution of this, of this problem with maximal gap is the so-called fermionic mean field theory. So this is a theory which has a very simple spectrum, just two delta sigma plus odd integers. These, these operators are, are the, 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 the basically the, the double, double trace composites of the, of the two fermions. So one can, one can prove a theorem which says that the OP of two identical primaries, sigma in a, in a unitary CFT, always contains a non-identity conformal primary of dimension delta less than two delta sigma plus one. Now I, I formulated it in, in a general CFT. I, I mean, the, 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 the reason this is true in general CFT, not just in 1D, is that in any CFT you can just, you can put the operators on a line and, and apply this logic. So this is actually true not just in 1D, but also in higher D. And the proof uh, is to construct the optimal functional. I unfortunately don't have time to go into details how how, we, how, how I did this, how we, how we did it, um, but the, the main ingredient is, is, is essentially the, 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 the double discontinuity. So the functional manages to reconstruct this uh, object, double discontinuity, which played an important role in, in the analytic bootstrap work recently. It is a nice, nice object which is positive and has double zeros on the, on the expected spectrum. Now, there is also some kernel, uh, which multiplies the conformal block, and it's, this kernel is uniquely fixed in the, in the construction. So there's just a unique way to, to do it, and it, it, it nicely works at the end. That's, that's all I want to say for now. But uh, so that, that was for the four-point function on a line, but, but how, do we, how do we now apply it to the modular bootstrap? Well, we can, we can do it because one can think of uh, the torus partition function as a four-point function, of twist of twist operators in the Z2 symmetric product uh, of the of the two theories. So the torus is can be thought of as a double cover of the four punctured sphere. In other words, you can get a torus by gluing together two of these planes with uh, uh, punctures at zero, one, infinity, and z. And z, which is the cross ratio of the four points, is related to the tau parameter of the torus using this modular form, theta functions. And as I as I said. The torus partition function of the original theory A on the is, e is proportional to the four-point function of twist operators, sigma, in the Z2 symmetric product orbifold of the theory at these two locations. At this location. Now, that this twist operator is a Verasoro primary of uh, scaling dimension C over eight. It lives in the, in the product orbifold. And nicely, the, the modular S, S transformation maps precisely to the, to the four-point function crossing transformation, z equals to one, one minus z. So this means that we, that we managed to reformulate, or it's possible to reformulate the, the modular bootstrap as a four-point function bootstrap. And one can then apply the analytic functional omega from the previous slide, which works in 1D, to the, to the modular bootstrap as well. So the, the naive conclu conclusion now would be that the, the optimal upper bound in the modular case, so the bound that we are after, is two delta sigma plus one, two delta sigma plus uh, over two. So two delta sigma plus one is the, is the bound for the four point, in four point function on the line, and <coughs> over, over two comes from the fact that we have a Z2 symmetric product, product orbifold, so we need to divide by two, which would be C over, C over eight plus a half. So this is, this is what we want to prove, but this argument is actually too quick. There's a subtlety that we are not expanding in the same objects in the 
boots on the conformal boots, proper function bootstrap and the modular bootstrap. So the Verasor characters of the torus are not the same as the SL2R conformal blocks. And what you need to what you need to check in the end uh, to to avoid to overcome this subtlety is whether the functional when when it acts on the vacuum is is non negative. So you you do that, and you you find the following conclusions. The su surprise surprise is that this function actually changes sign precisely at central charge equal to four and central charge twelve, and it's positive uh, between one and four and twelve and infinity. So in the region where it's positive, you can conclude that c over eight plus a half is a val is a valid bound. The omega is a is a valid functional because it satisfies this the constraint that it needs to. It's positive on the vacuum, but it's it's suboptimal. It's it's not the it's not the optimal functional. It's not the optimal bound, but it's nevertheless a valid bound. And in this region where c is between four and twelve, uh, the functional is completely useless, and uh, the bound is bigger than c over eight plus a half. Now the nice thing happens exactly at c equal four and c equal twelve, because c over eight plus a half at these two points is precisely the optimal bound, because the functional functional vanish, vanishes there, and you can you can check that it really is the optimal bound. So at c equal four, when you plug in four into this formula, you get one. The, sp the optimal spectrum it consists of positive integers, and the partition function is uh, is that of eight free fermions with a diagonal GSO projection. And for c equal 12, you plug in 12, you get two here, and spectrum is the same except but one is omitted. And partition function is just the chiral half of the of the monster CFT. So that, that which looks like even though the monster CFT has central charge 24, the chiral half looks like a partition function of a c equal 12 theory. And these two cases will map to the solution of the sphere packing problem in, in eight and 24 dimensions. So notice that four is eight over two and 12 is 24 over two. So, so now um, the, let, let me explain how all of this is, is connected to the, to the sphere packing problem. The problem is very, very easy to state. It just uh, we are supposed to find the densest arrangement of identical non-overlapping spheres in, in D dimensions. It's a very deep problem with connections to many areas of pure mathematics, like number theory, cryptography, and so on. But it's it's quite hard to solve, except in, except for in low dimensions. In in one dimension, the problem is trivial. In two dimensions, uh, the solution is the is the honeycomb lattice. In three dimensions, it's already a bit harder to prove. The Kepler's conjecture states that the face in the cubic lattice, as was proven by Hales in 1998, it took computer 11 years to, to verify or this, this proof. So it's, it's, already, it's, it's, pretty, it's getting quite hard at uh, in three dimensions. And in fact, in, in, in more than three dimensions, the problem is open with the exception of two cases. One is eight dimensions, where it was uh, famously shown by Vyazovska a couple of years ago that the E8, E8 lattice gives the optimal packing. And in 24 dimensions, a paper which appeared just a week after the the eight-dimensional paper has shown that the leech lattice is, is optimal. Uh, now, I, I, what all, all you need to know for now about, about these cases is that both of these are even subdual lattices. So e even means that the spectrum of norm squared in the of, of distances between the sphere centers look like this. So the EA has this is the E8 spectrum, and this is the leech lattice spectrum. Uh, I, I want to stress that in the sphere packing problem, there is no requirement for the configuration to be a lattice in general. So it's like a low dimension coincidence that these are these are lattices. But efficient packings in large number of dimensions actually are supposed to be uh, most likely highly irregular. Now, um, in, the, in the rest of the talk, I I want to show you how how you can prove this this Aiden. You can solve this uh, the, the sphere from eight and twenty-four dimensions using bootstrap-like ideas, which was in fact how it was it was proven in the in the math literature. Uh, so the idea, which goes back to Kohn and Elkies, is uh, is to prove a universal upper bound on the density of any packing in E dimensions and show that this bound is satura saturated by the E8 and the Leech lattice in eight and twenty-four dimensions. So this would solve solve the problem. Now here is a here is a short short condensed version of the of the argument first of all we can we can assign a partition function to to a sphere packing the partition function looks like that uh, it's a sum over all pairs of spheres in the in the packing 
uh, it depends on d over here in the power of the eta function, and this factor up up is the is the distance between sphere centers. Now the Poisson summation formula implies that this partition function satisfies a modular bootstrap-like identity under the S transformation. So we can use modular bootstrap for that. Spe uh, specifically, you can notice that this this is basically the character for not for Virasora but for the algebra you want to the C, where the central charge C is related to the dimensionality where the packing lives by d over two. So eight and twenty four would become four and twelve. And the scaling dimension, the, the role of the scaling dimension over here is played by the, the distance squared between uh, between two spheres, sphere centers. So delta gap is basically the shortest distance between sphere centers of two non-identical spheres in the packing. So this means that we can use functional bootstrap to derive an upper bound on, on delta gap, and it, it follows from such an upper bound delta gap that there is, a, there is a corresponding upper bound on the sphere packing density. Now, the conclusion then is that the modular bootstrap in the presence of a U1 to the C symmetry as opposed to Virasora constrains the sphere packing density in D equals two C dimensions. And this is what you get when you put the problem on a computer, as was done by, by Kohn, and, Kohn and Elkies for the first time. The red curve is the, is the upper bound on the sphere packing density following from this logic, it's a, it's a numerical bound, and the blue dots are the actual best known packings in various dimensions. And you can immediately notice that the bound is saturated in a couple of examples, so especially eight and 24 dimensions, or at least it appears to be saturated. So, so, so to complete the, the proof, the solution, you, you need to show that it, it is it is precisely saturated at these two points, which you cannot really do with the numerics, but you need to figure it out analytically. So the last step is, uh, well, we, we, already, we already saw this idea to prove the optimality of the saturation of some bound. You can use the analytic functionals again. So here is, here's another plot where I showed the, the comparison between the, the Virasora bound and the sphere packing bound. You see that at c equal four and 12, they, they coincide with this 1B bound, C plus four over eight. And in fact, you can use the exact same functional that uh, was first uh, seen in 1D, 1D conformal bootstrap. We, and I explained how to use it in the Verasura bootstrap. You can use it also here for the sphere packing bootstrap. And you, and you, you show that uh, E8 and leash lattice are indeed optimal in eight and 24 dimensions. So what I have just described is a, is a very condensed version of, uh, of the Azovska solution. So let me, let me summarize. Uh, I showed you first that the first uh, non-identity primary in, in a unitary 2D CFT must satisfy that delta gap is less than C over eight plus a half. And this result can be strengthened a little bit to two C over 17 at large central charge, but I didn't, I didn't show you the proof of that, but it's, it's a small generalization. Via ADS CFT, this gives a rigorous constraint on the spectrum of black hole microstates in any 3D theory of quantum gravity in ADS. The bounds were derived from unitarity and modular invariance using uh, analytic functionals. And a very similar bound constrains the density of sphere packings in D dimensions. And in this context, the analytic functionals were discovered, although in a, in a slightly different guise, uh, by Vyazovska, who, who didn't call them analytic functionals, but magic functions, um, leading to, to her solution of the sphere packing problem in eight and 24 dimensions. Let me finish with some open questions. Uh, it would be very nice to, to understand the true asymptotics of the Verasora modular bootstrap at large C. I just showed you that there is an upper bound, which is like C over 8.5, but this is still not the optimal result. And maybe with some extra assumptions, we can even rule out pure gravity. And in fact, there was a very interesting recent, recent work which, uh, which goes uh, some way towards this goal. You can ask the same question on the sphere packing side, namely, what is the asymptotics of the Kohn Elke sphere packing bound in large number of dimensions? And is it better than the best known bound currently known? So the, the best currently known bound is, uh, dates back to 1970. So any, any improvement on it would be, would be a huge success. And it's, it's possible that this linear programming idea can actually improve the bound at large C. It would also be nice to combine the t our technique with the complex Taubert theorems. Uh, to get more detailed information about the spectrum. But uh, maybe the, the most interesting question is, is how deep is the analogy between CFTs and, and sphere packings? So I explained to you that the simplest constraint agrees on the two sides, but a variety of other constraints exist on, on both sides. 
So on the CFD side or, or quantum gravity side, we have modular bootstrap with, with spin, four point function crossing bootstrap and higher genus bootstrap and so on. Uh, and similarly on the side of the sphere packings, there are also, there are also other constraints. So basically this, the bound I, I told you about uh, ex exploits the exploits the two-point correlation between spheres, but there are also endpoint correlations. So maybe they are, these two are somehow related. Now there, there are some additional hints that sphere packings and quantum gravity could be related uh, in a deeper way. Uh, this is more speculative. Um, we know that black holes in quantum gravity exhibit chaos, so the microstates maybe have this uh, uh, no, random matrix-like behavior. And at the same time, it is known that efficient packings in a large number of dimensions are highly disordered. So hi a large number of dimensions is related to weak, weakly coupled gravity because D goes like the central charge. So ma maybe there is some connection there. And also, there, there are hints of this UV-IR connection because uh, uh, the large operators with, with large scaling dimensions uh, were coming from large distances in the, in the packing. So perhaps this, maybe this means that we should be thinking about spheres as living in the ADS and uh, so something like that. So with that, I, I thank you and I'll leave you the dictionary. Wow, questions. On the sphere packing side, these, one of the amazing things with these magic functions were expressed in terms of explicit modular forms times some mm -hmm. sign factor. Uh, in the conformal bootstrap, do, do you end up with an interpretation of these explicit forms or are they constructed numerically? Uh, they're constructed uh, uh, analytically. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a very good, very good question. Uh, actually, from our point of view, it, it seems that the it, it really looks like the modular forms are, are, are not that important, that somehow the, the, the exact same function, I mean, the, 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 the functional which works for the 1D bootstrap is exactly the same as the functional that works, uh, that works for the sphere pack, that, that gives you th these magic functions, and on the conformal bootstrap four-point functions, uh, there are no modular forms, so, so really the, o the, the, the reason why modular forms appear in the ma magic functions is because of the pillow map. So but, uh, yeah. but is there a way of deriving the explicit modular forms that yeah, appear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we, 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 we know that using this logic, we know the, the specific kernel in, in for the 1D bootstrap, and you just, you just do the pillow map, and you, you end up with, uh, with the kernel for the, which gives you the magic function of the Elgotska, completely explicitly. Yes. So here you use the three spheres for the second symmetric product of the theory. Mm -hmm. Could you do other three spheres and symmetric product? Um, you you could. Uh, so in, in some specific uh, setup, this would uh, this this could map to the the higher genus modular bootstrap, okay. perhaps. Uh, but yeah, we we haven't we haven't thought about it, and it's it's quite possible it, it would lead to even better bounds at cent at large central charge. So that's that's a nice thing to try. Any other question? No, I have one, actually. How unique is your functional omega that you wrote down? Uh, so in the, in the case of the, of the Bundy bootstrap, it's, it's unique. So the, 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 the problem in that case is parameterized by the external dimension, delta sigma. And for each, for each delta sigma, you have a different functional. But, but for each, each delta sigma, the functional is, is unique. It's, it's, it may not, I mean, th th there's no theorem that this is what happens in general. Like, for example, you can ask, is there such a unique functional that gives you the spectrum of the three-dimensional three lasing model in the Hardy bootstrap? And that's, that's not currently known. But it's, it's a very good question. Thank you. If there are no further questions, uh, let's, uh, let's thank uh, Ramana again. <laughs>